Hi everyone. Welcome to Introduction to Regional Center Services for Housing Advocates, a webinar presented by Disability Rights California and Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. My name is Michelle Uzetta. Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, or DREDF. Um, DREDF is a national civil rights law and policy center um, that advocates the civil and human rights of people with disabilities through legal advocacy, training, education, and public policy and legislative development. We are also an IOLTA-funded support center for legal services providers throughout the state of California. Um, what we are going to cover in this webinar today, we're covering a lot, that's why it's a 90-minute webinar, um, Lanterman Act Basics, Eligibility for Regional Center Services, uh, regional center services and getting services authorized through the individual program, program plan or IPP process, regional center services that can help people find and keep housing in the community, and appealing regional center decisions. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. With us today is Will Lehner, Managing Attorney of the Legal Advocacy Unit at Disability Rights California. Uh, Vivian Juan, Senior Policy Attorney at the Legal Advocacy Unit at Disability Rights California. Wilmarie Torres, Clients' Rights Advocate, North Los Angeles Regional Center, Office of Clients' Rights Advocacy. And Fatima Perez, Assistant Clients' Rights Advocate at North LA Regional Center, Office of Clients' Rights Advocacy. And with that, I will turn it over to Will. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today. And before we jump into things like regional center eligibility and the types of services that regional centers can provide to help people keep and find housing, I wanted to give you all some context about what regional centers are, why they exist, and the scope of their legal mandates, which we refer to as the Management Act entitlement. So I wanted to start with a really small uh, history lesson. So the Management Act is a state law that was passed in 1969. And before the Management Act, institutions called state hospitals or developmental centers were the primary provider of state-funded services to people with IDD. At their peak, in 1968, a California's developmental center system warehoused and isolated over 13,000 people in seven facilities. Now, things started to change in the late 1960s with the passage of the Management Act. It's what created our state law entitlement, our state's developmental disabilities services system. And there are a few things that drove this change. First, nationally and in California, people with disabilities began calling for a movement for equal access to all aspects of community life and the removal of barriers that excluded and segregated them. Second, there was a greater public spotlight on the overcrowding, the dehumanizing practices, the dangerous conditions, and the abuse of people who lived in California institutions. And third, families started demanding change. Parents were given this binary choice of either caring for their disabled children at home without supports or sending them away to institutions and they were often encouraged to send their children away to institutions. So they lobbied for change. They lobbied for a community-based system of supports because there, there had to be a better way. And they got it with the passage of the Management Act. So for the first time, there was this robust statutory scheme where the state accepted both a responsibility for people with developmental disabilities and an obligation that it needed to discharge. So let's quickly talk about those obligations, which my colleagues will explain in greater detail later in the presentation. So the first obligation, the Management Act requires that the state um, have an array of supports that meet the needs and choices of people with IDD. 
So this is so that people and their families never have to go back to this binary choice of either no supports in a family home or having them live in an institution or out of home setting. Second, the services need to be designed to prevent people from being dislocated from their families and communities. Again, no surprise given the ugly history of institutionalization in our system. And third, the services need to be designed to enable people with IDD to approximate the pattern of everyday living that is realized by people without disabilities. So in other words, disabled people in our system have the right to services so they can live where they want and with whom they want, um, to spend time doing things that are meaningful that, to them and bring them joy, just like we all do. Next slide, please. So this slide describes the structure of our system. So in order to fulfill the obligations that I just discussed, the Nantrimin Act established our Developmental Disability Services System as an entitlement to services at state expense. And there are two primary pieces to the system. So under the Nantrimin Act, the California Department of Developmental Services is the state agency that has jurisdiction over the laws relating to the care, the custody, and treatment of people with developmental disabilities. In other words, uh, the buck stops with them. But our California Department of Developmental Services, we also call them TDS for short, they contract with nonprofit corporations known as regional centers who determine what services should be provided to people with IDD. And then regional centers in turn contract with different agencies or individuals to provide these services. We call them service providers or vendors. And today there are 21 regional centers in California that serve nearly 400,000 people with IDD. And each regional center serves a geographic, different geographic area, um, all the way from the top of California down to our Southern border. And there's a map of California that you can't quite make out, but we can share a link that just identifies the different regional centers and all the geographic regions that they support. So regional centers, they are all operated with their own governing boards. And anyone that's been in this system a minute has observed that there are 21 different regional centers. And that means there are 21 different ways of doing things too. Um, and just one more point, you know, regional centers are nonprofit agencies, but don't let that nonprofit designation trick you into thinking that regional centers don't have a lot of funding or a lot of power. Um, the governor's budget in 2023 to 24 allocated $13.6 billion, and that's billion with a B, uh, to regional centers. $12.1 billion, again with a B, um, is supposed to be um, used to purchase services and supports for the people served by our system. Next slide, please. So quickly, um, what do regional centers do? Well, at a high level, they are gatekeepers. Um, they assess people for Nantrimin Act eligibility. So they are the ones that decide whether someone has the type of disability that entitles them to services. And we'll get into that um, in the next couple of slides. Regional centers also assign service coordinators to people served. And the service coordinator is the person responsible for making sure that people are getting the supports they need and for coordinating and advocating for those supports. Our regional centers also create a plan about someone's needs and services. Um, it's called an individualized program plan. And then again, regional centers contact with vendors or service providers to purchase and secure the services in someone's IPP. And lastly, a major role of the regional center is to develop resources so there's an adequate network to make sure that there are no gaps in our service delivery system. And next slide, and I'll pass things over to one of my colleagues who will talk about eligibility for regional center services. Hello, 
Um, again, my name is Will Mary. I'm the client's rights advocate um, for specifically for North Los Angeles um, County Regional Center. So I'll be going over the eligibility requirements for regional center services. So what do you have to be eligible for in order to become a what we call a consumer of regional center or a client to regional center? You can go ahead and go to the second slide. Next slide. So who is eligible? So there are certain requirements that you have to meet um, in order to be eligible for these regional center consumers. And I have a list here. So to qualify, you must have a developmental disability, which we'll go over of what that means. And that developmental disability must have originated prior to the age of 18. And the developmental disability must be substantial. Or there's another small section that um, for individuals who are ages zero to five, there's also a specific qualifications, which we call provisional eligibility, which allows them to get services, but doesn't have to meet the same requirements um, as um, the ones on top. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So what does it mean to have a developmental disability? Um, so a developmental disability includes Five, um, five options, right, that you can fall into in order to meet this requirement. So number one is intellectual disability, two, cerebral palsy, three, epilepsy, four, autism, and number five, which is kind of the catch-all eligibility, it's called the fifth category. And it's important to go a little bit in depth because um, sometimes you do fall into the fifth category and you want to prove um, that it's within the fifth category. Um, so it's closely related to the intellectual disability um, and that it requires treatment similar to that required for the intellectual disability. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So a little bit more about that fifth category. A lot of our applicants that are applying do fall in that fifth category, and it's sometimes a little bit difficult to be eligible under that fifth category. So again, the condition must be very similar to intellectual disability. Um, and so we look at the cognitive skills. So they would do an IQ test. And so the person may have an IQ test an IQ number over 75, but still needs treatment similar to a person with intellectual disability. So that's what may qualify you under that fifth category. And you also have maybe an impaired adapted functioning, meaning that you have difficulties doing, you know, basic activities of daily life, like getting ready, um, you know, working, being able to access um, your home or your, the community. And so if you're applying under the fifth, fifth category, it's really, really important that you bring records and assessment that show these limitations in these two parts, the cognitive level and the adaptive skills. And then the next part, we can go to the next slide. Um, which is the next um, part, which is you have to show that this developmental disability is substantial. So it doesn't just qualify you if you just have autism, it doesn't automatically qualify you for regional center service. You must also show that the, that, that autism is substantial or cerebral palsy is substantial. And so what does that mean of substantial? So even if an individual has a diagnosis of one of the five developmental disabilities, you must show that it's substantial. So substantial disability means that the individual has significant functional limitations in three or more major life activities. And so what are those major life activities? So what evidence do we have to show that it is substantial? So go ahead to the next slide. Um, so there's seven major life activities. So think about this if an applicant is applying for regional center services and you have to show evidence that it is substantial. So you have to show maybe medical records, school records, um, Yeah, medical records, school records, psychological records, any assessments done, you must show that there is a limitation in at least three of these life activities, meaning self-care, taking care of oneself, receptive and expressive langu language, receiving how someone processes the language and how someone expresses language, learning, uh, mobility, mobility. 
self-direction, the ability to regulate or adapt their own behaviors to the demands around us, um, making their own decisions, um, and then capacity for independent living and economic self-sufficiency. Keep in mind when an individual is applying and they're younger than 18, um, we're comparing that of maybe of that 10 year old. So they're not necessarily have to have that economic self-sufficiency because a uh, child that is 10 years old and doesn't have a disability wouldn't have that economic self-sufficiency. Um, and key, also what's really important is that connection of Yes, I have a limitation in these one of these seven major life activities, and it but however, it must be linked to that developmental disability. Can't be connected to something else, um, like maybe a mental disorder. It must be connected to that developmental disability. Next slide. And so that connection is really, really important, and that's what regional center looks it looks at. So your mental limit, um, your limitations are not solely um, physical disability. So a person with a disability that only affects your physical abilities is not eligible. And then it's not solely a psychiatric disorder. So a person who has social and intellectual function issues that are caused solely by a psychiatric disorder is not eligible. So if somebody has a mental disorder and has limitations in one of those seven areas, doesn't qualify you for regional center. But if you have a mental disorder, but also have a developmental disability, you must show that those limitations are caused by that developmental disability and not only that mental disorder. So it's okay that someone might have one of those five categories, be eligible under those five categories, but uh, and have a mental disorder, but we just wanna make sure that those limitations are from the developmental disability in order to qualify for regional center services. Um, next slide. So um, this is basically what I was discussing. Um, so you may have, and this comes up a lot, you may have that learning, that physical and psychiatric disability, and also have that developmental disabilities. Um, but you must show that those symptoms are for the, from that developmental disability and not because of the other two items. And then um, next slide. And then I talked a little bit in the beginning, there's a provisional eligibility for children that are under five who are not eligible under the regional center because they may not fall under one of those five qualifying conditions, but they might need some support. And so there's this provisional eligibility that might give them, that will give them those services and supports in those areas of need, but they do not need to fall under the five qualifying conditions. So instead, they must show that there's a functional limitation in at least two of the following areas of major life activity. So self-care, receptive, and expressive language, learning, mobility, self-direction. And again, it cannot um, be solely in phys um, solely physical in nature. And so I went over all this eligibility. So let's say you do have a client um, that might need regional center services and that might be eligible. Um, so how does one apply? Go to the next slide. And so applying for regional center services, um, you contact the regional center that is closest to where you live, and then you make that appointment, you make that initial intake meeting. Keep in mind, there's 21 regional centers, so you have to figure out which regional center you belong to, depending on where you live. Um, and I think there might be a link already sent out. You can put your area code. Um, um, you can put them where you live and then it'll let you know which regional center you belong to. Um, and so you reach out to them um, and then that initial meeting must be held within 15 days. Um, it must be held within the applicant or the parent's native language. So if it's a Spanish speaking client, um, it needs to be in Spanish. Um, you must bring all relevant records like doctor's notes, school records, health insurance that show applicants' developmental history. One important thing is that one of the requirements is that you must be 
must the disability must originated before the age of 18. If you're applying after the age of 18, it's really, really important that you bring records that show that dis that disability originated before the age of 18. So what what was that individual like at age five? What was that individual like um, at age 10? So it's really important to go all the way back and provide that information in order to meet that eligibility. And so once you do that initial intake meeting, Regional Center will decide if it will complete a formal assessment to determine eligibility for services, meaning if they're going to have a psychologist hired by Regional Center to conduct an assessment and create a report to determine if you meet those qualifications. Next slide. Um, so how long does this take and how long do I have to wait for? So after that initial intake meeting, Regional Center has 120 days. So about four months to make that decision. However, keep in mind that it could go a little bit quicker. And if you meet, um, if the longer you wait, it puts the applicant's health at risk. There's the risk of further delay in the mental or physical development, and there is eminent risk of placement in a more restrictive setting. And one of the biggest thing is that third one, a more restrictive setting, meaning that maybe that child will need to go to a facility if he doesn't get the services and support sooner. Um, so you must show to, um, to the regional center of these circumstances by showing evidence that this is, might be happening in order to move this process along. And so let's say you do apply, go through the process, and you receive a decision. Next slide. Um, so the regional center approves the applicant's application and you receive that, yes, you are eligible for regional center services and support. And so as an app, instead of an applicant, you are now um, become a consumer or client of the regional center. And you must receive an individual program plan, an IPP, um, which is a meeting, which will go over what is an IPP and what does that look like, what's in it. Um, that meeting to create that IPP needs to be held within 60 days. And that meeting is held with your service coordinator. And so that IPP includes the services and supports provided by the regional center. So there's a discussion about what are um, the strengths and weaknesses of the consumer client and um, how can we support that consumer client to become as independent as possible. And if you have an unfavorable decision after applying for regional center um, services, the regional center must provide you a notice of action. And a notice of action is basically a letter that is written and it's sent to you through mail explaining why they did not find the applicant qualifies for regional center services and support. If you disagree with that notice of action, you have the opportunity to appeal. And it's really important within that notice of action, there'll be directions on how to appeal. And when I mean appeal, you can, um, it's requesting a hearing from an administrative law judge. And you wanna make sure if you're going through this process of appealing, that you're gathering more information to provide to regional center and the judge. And we have a great resource, um, which will have a resource slide on it that has a toolkit when somebody is appealing, how to prepare for that appeal process. So the next part um, will be my colleague, um, Fatima. So uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and pass it. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fatima Perez. I'm the Assistant Clients Rights Advocate for Office of Clients Rights. And our office serves the consumers of the North Los Angeles Regional Center. And I will be talking about regional center services. Um, next slide, please. And when we talk about, um, when we're looking at regional center services, we are really looking at uh, what services a regional center could provide to the clients to uh, 
uh, lessen the effects of the developmental disability to help them have a normal, independent, and productive life and uh, learn new skills. Next slide, please. And here is a list of the services that are offered by the regional center to the clients. Um, we uh, the services really depend on the need and uh, of the of the clients and are designed to meet their uh, their specific needs. So it really depends um, on the on each client. Each case is different. Um, and as you can see, we have um, different uh, services here. We have assessment services, habilitation and training, treatment and therapy, prevention services, living arrangements, community integration, employment, and family support services, relationship services, and um, emergency and crisis intervention, recreation services, specialized equipment, transportation, and facilitation services, self-advocacy and advocacy. Next slide, please. Who pays for the regional center services? In general, families are not required to pay for consumer services and support listed in the IPP. However, there are exceptions. Families may be required to pay for portion of respite day, daycare or camping services if they meet certain criteria. Parents of children under the age of 18 who receive out of home care may be required to pay some of the cost. Um, regional centers cannot ask families to pay for other regional center services listed in the consumer's IPP. And regional centers cannot deny a services because the family cannot pay for it. Next slide. Uh, duty to generic resources. Generic resources should be pursued first as regional center is the payer of last resort. Uh, generic res uh, services are provided by other agencies such as Medi-Cal, Medicare, um, in-home supportive services, uh, Department of Rehabilitation, school district, private insurance, or healthcare services plan. And it's important to always consider whether the need service is actually available from the generic resources and it is um, actually duplicative. Next slide, please. Uh, regional center acts like a gap filler. If no generic resources can provide service, regional center can provide. If generic resources denies the services, the regional center can provide them. Um, it's important to bring a notice, a denial notice to prove that you have pursued generic resources first and has been denied. Uh, regional centers can provide, but rarely uh, get funding um, and assist advocacy assistance in pursuing generic resources. Generic resources should be included in the IPP. Next slide, please. And purchase of services policies. These are guidelines for purchasing services and support from the regional center. It explains the requirements for receiving the services and it may set time limits on them. Um, additionally, this uh, varies um, from regional center to regional center. It must be cost effective and it cannot narrow the scope of the Lenderman Act entitlement or place fixed limits on services that interfere with individualized determinations made through the IPP process. And um, Will Mary will explain the next part. And so we keep talking about this IPP. So it's an individual program plan. And you can think about this if you um, have worked with a like an IEP um, from the school district. It's similar, um, but a little bit different, um, but it's very, very similar. Um, so what is an individual program plan and why is that so important when you become a consumer? And so we call this, an IPP can be used for the process, the actual document and the meeting. 
And so what is an IPP and what is the IPP process? You can go to the next slide. So an IPP process is basically a docu it's a document. So it's a contract between the consumer and the regional center in which we discuss who the consumer is in the IPP document. So the IPP document should reflect the consumer strengths and weaknesses, the consumer's goals and what they want to achieve, and also list all the services and supports that regional center will implement and should implement. Um, and this must be held every three years, but it's usually every year. But keep in mind that you can request an IPP at any time and it must be held within 30 days of the request. So how do I request an IPP for a client? It's a quick email um, or a letter sent to regional center. If it's, if it's um, through a phone call, please follow up by email to make sure that you have some sort something in writing that you have requested to make sure that if they do not um, hold the IPP meeting or schedule the IPP meeting within 30 days of your request, you have evidence that it's been past 30 days and you can file some sort of, sort of complaint. Now, Sorry. One of the also very important thing is this IPP is individualized. It's every IPP should be individualized, so it should be different compared to other clients within regional center. So what, what we call that, it should be person-centered. It should be the client. When we are talking in the IPP, we need to make sure that our focus is the person, the consumer, and our focus is not the policies or anything other factors, um, because we need to make sure that we're following the Lanterman Act, meaning that we are providing services for this person to become as independent as possible as they would like um, in all areas of their life. Um, so that is very important. And sometimes we need to remind everybody at an IPP meeting that this is our focus is on the consumer and it should be person centered. So we should be thinking of the consumer and the client first. And so let's say I have this IPP meeting. And so what are the parts of the IPP? So we have a section of goals and objectives. So what does the client want? What does, what is the consumer thinking about? And, you know, two months from now, what goals do I want to achieve? Five years from now, what goals I want to achieve? And it can be in different areas, right? It can be education. Um, it can be communica um, community integration. Maybe they're in a facility right now and then they would like to live independently in their own home or their own apartment with a roommate, or maybe they want to live in a group home. Um, so that goal should be written in there. There should be an area for also recreational activities. Um, so that's also um, really great that Regional Center also provides, and it's kind of um, been re-implemented again, provides um, recreational activities, meaning social activities, meaning camping, um, if they want to go swimming, if they want to be part of a sport, that should also, there should also be a goal on that. When you think of an IPP, you want to think of like, what are all the parts of a person? Um, so another area is also communication. Um, and so if they have difficulties communicating, right, that expressive and receptive language, what goal, what are we going to do um, in order to help that consumer achieve the goal in that area? And so the goals should be attached to a service or a support that regional center might provide, or maybe a generic resource will be providing at that time because that's available. Um, so there should be an area where it has the types and the amounts of services and supports um, that is that regional center will provide. It's really important that it is if it is discussed and if, if you become, you agreed to a, uh, a service that regional center will provide, it's on that IPP document. Um, the IPP also has a review of the health status. Um, so a lot of times um, service coordinators will ask 
points. Um, the last hospitalization, can you provide medical records for the past few years in order to make sure we're updated? What are the medications they're providing? Um, the last dentist appointment. Um, so we just want to make sure that all aspects of the individual is taken care of. And then there's a schedule for review and evaluation of the IPP, the outcomes. And so what are we, when are we going to review it again? And um, how long are we going to take to get to certain goals? Um, after you have this IPP meeting, you can request your IPP document because you want to make sure you review it. Um, and your service coordinator should give it to you in the language that you need it be um, within 45 days. So why is an IPP so important? If you ever want to get a specific service, I never want my client to only send an email to the service coordinator requesting the service because it might get lost and then nothing is put in the IPP. And remember, the IPP is a contract. And if it's not in the IPP, then how do you show that regional center agreed to it? It's a little bit more difficult. Um, so it's important because it lists the services and supports that regional center will provide. And also lists when exactly they'll provide an approximate date. It will start until it will last. And so if a service is written into the IPP and the regional center does not provide it, then you need to go, hey, it's written in the IPP. You agreed to provide it. So regional center must provide it. Um, so it's really, really important that if there's a service in there, you're following up to make sure that service is being provided and why, if it's not, um, then following up why, and if they need to figure out some sort of creative way to make sure that service is being provided. And then, yep, that's the end of the IPP process. Um, and we're going to the Regional Center Housing Services. Thanks so much, Will Mary. Uh, hi, my name is Vivian Hahn um, at Disability Rights California. I am a senior policy attorney where, uh, and I'm part of the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Practice Group. Um, so we are finally um, at the point where we're going to talk about housing specific services that are available through regional centers. And first I should preface all of this uh, by saying that while we will go over the types of services that are technically available through regional centers, um, on a realistic local level, your mileage may vary, meaning that um, their actual availability depends um, largely on which regional center you're talking about. Some regional centers may have some more robust offerings um, of these types of services and other regional centers, not so much. Um, there are some regional centers that might not, where the service coordinators might not even be very aware um, of what's available. Um, so um, I just wanted to add that note before we go forward. Next slide. So um, in terms of what can be available through regional centers, uh, there are three main types of housing related supports. Uh, one is housing access services. And a lot of these um, may be familiar to you if some of you um, are familiar with Cal AIM and some of the housing access services that they are starting to provide over there. Um, over here in the uh, DDS slash regional center system, those types of housing access services have been available for some time, um, but they are not widely known about. So we'll talk about those. Funding for home modifications is also possible and available uh, under the Lannerman Act. Um, it's not always easy to get, but we'll talk about that too. And last but not least, um, rental assistance. This is also something that is not very well known, but in um, certain very limited circumstances, regional centers can and will provide rental subsidies to regional center consumers um, if there is a demonstrated health and safety need for it. And we will go over that too. Next slide. So first category, housing access services. Um, 
there are all kinds of housing related supports that a person can get through their IPP uh, from a service provider, uh, just like all the other services that my colleagues mentioned previously. Um, and one of those is housing transition services. So the providers or I guess regional center vendors who provide this service can provide all kinds of supports that can just help the person obtain and maintain their housing. So some of the bullet points you see here, um, everything from the beginning, just identifying, helping to identify and articulate the need um, and that the person's preferences in terms of what their housing needs might be. Um, preparation of the IPP, helping out with possible sources of funding. So in other words, if the regional center says, have you exhausted other uh, generic resources, uh, which we talked about before, um, if this person can help explain, uh, talk about, well, section eight with some of the other things, uh, those things aren't very available or forthcoming. So uh, they can talk about that. They can help with housing applications, uh, communications with uh, landlords or potential landlords. They can also help develop a housing support crisis plan, which is, um, I, I think, really critical um, in case something comes up and uh, if there's often, if there is, things can change on a dime for a lot of the clients that we serve. And if there's not a crisis plan in place ahead of time, um, that can make things uh, potentially dire for, um, for that client. So this is somebody who can help not just come up with a plan, but help uh, your client have some supports in place to make sure that their housing can be maintained um, in case of a crisis. Next slide. So uh, housing and tenancy sustaining services. So once um, the person is in their own place, uh, the provider can provide some ongoing support to help keep them there. So uh, if there are disputes or disagreements with neighbors or with their landlord, um, if for whatever reason they get an eviction notice or there's something brewing on that end, uh, this person can be there to help provide some advocacy. Um, they, it wouldn't be legal advocacy necessarily, but um, they can provide assistance on that front. Um, ongoing assessment to address other barriers to retaining housing. Um, and also just like the day-to-day -day stuff, help with things like the timely payment of bills, making sure that rent is paid on time, um, other household management um, issues that could be, um, that could contribute to um, a barrier to maintaining housing. Those are all things uh, that these providers can support with. Next slide. Okay, home modifications. Um, and if you um, have helped others uh, with other clients with housing related needs, this is probably something that you're more familiar with. Um, in our system, they're also called environmental accessibility adaptations. And this can include um, a wide range of physical adaptations uh, to the person's home uh, when they're required by their plan of care. And these are modifications that um, are really necessary to ensure the health, welfare, or safety of the individual, or that enable them to function with greater independence in the home. We'll give you some examples. Next slide. So, um, a lot of you may be familiar with these types of home modifications. These are some of the most common ones. Um, I've certainly seen um, many requests for bathroom modifications, roll in shower, grab bars, uh, modifications that can help uh, people be more independent when it comes to toileting, for instance. Um, but it's not limited to that. I mean, we have a graph. Uh, visual of a ramp here, but it can also be things like um, flashing light alerts uh, for someone who may have a hearing impairment and for whom a regular alarm might not might not cut it. Um, 
other types of enabling technologies, for instance, um, soundproofing. Uh, sometimes um, if people can be loud or if they have um, behavior or other things that uh, can sometimes be overheard by, by neighbors um, and if that can contribute to issues, neighbor issues, uh, soundproofing can be something um, that, that can be helpful. So just pointing out some of the uh, maybe more creative supports uh, that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities might need that can be available through the regional center. Next slide. Okay, my personal favorite, rental assistance. Um, Unfortunately, with the type of rental assistance that regional centers can provide under the Lanterman Act, um, it's not really uh, purely need-based. Uh, surely financial need is, is taken into account as part of this, um, but in addition to financial need, there does need to be a pretty significant, fairly imminent risk to that person's health or safety. Um, in other words, if they have to not only be experiencing difficulty paying their rent, uh, being able to afford their monthly rent, um, you also need to be able to show um, that without that housing, uh, there will be a pretty significant and immediate risk of some kind of harm. Um, and regional centers generally interpret that to be a pretty high standard. However, um, if your client does meet that standard, there are a couple of other things that you should know. Uh, first, if they need to be living in their own homes. And that doesn't mean ownership. It can be renting or leasing. But what that means is that this type of rental assistance is not available to people who are living in the family home. For instance, adult adults with disabilities who may still be living with their parents um, or with their conservators, for example. They are unfortunately are not eligible, eligible uh, for rental assistance um, under the Lanterman Act. In addition to that, they not only have to be living in their own place, they also have to be receiving supported living services, which is a type of wraparound, uh, really wonderful, very comprehensive uh, set of supports that's highly individualized. It can really help people with even the most significant support needs uh, to live in their own places uh, by themselves with help. Um, so it's pretty limited. Uh, currently under the law, but um, it can be um, a, a huge lifesaver uh, for individuals when they do meet the criteria. Um, the other thing to know is that in addition to meeting all, all this criteria, uh, this type of request does have to be approved by the executive director of the regional center uh, before it can go through. Next slide. Uh, and that brings us to um, to Michelle's portion of the slides. Hi, everyone. Um, it's important to understand how regional center services and supports intersect with fair housing rights. Uh, so that's what the next couple of slides is are going to address. Um, one of the rights prospective tenants and tenants have under federal and state fair housing law is the right to reasonable accommodations. And I provided some um, citations in the chat for everyone. Um, a reasonable accommodation, as many of you already know, is a change in a rule, policy, practice, or service that's necessary to allow a person with a disability equal opportunity to use and enjoy their housing. And some examples may include adjustment of someone's rental due date to accommodate the date that they receive public benefits um, or the waiver of a no pet policy to accommodate someone who uses an assistance animal. Um, there's really no limit on accommodations that can be provided. Um, they just have to be necessary um, for the person to use and enjoy their housing. Uh, for a client of a regional center, housing providers may have to make reasonable accommodations um, such as accepting rental assistance that we just heard about from the regional center and not declining that type of source of income. 
um, communicating with service coordinators or other regional center staff in the application process for housing or during the tenancy to deal with notice or um, to manage crises or conflicts between uh, management and the tenant or between tenants um, to deal with other kinds of disputes or address perceived lease violations um, to navigate relocation when that becomes an issue. Sometimes people will need more time to move um, because of a disability and need for accessible housing and the regional center could assist in helping in that process and the landlord would have to allow that person additional time to work with the regional center in order to navigate that process. Um, housing providers may also need to make arrangements um, in light of regional center services and supports. So for example, if somebody has caregivers that come to the home or, or provide respite to a home, the housing provider may need to arrange for guest parking or other accommodations to allow those types of services to be delivered um, at the housing location. Next slide. Housing providers are also required to allow reasonable modifications uh, to a unit or common areas of housing when necessary for a person with a disability to use or enjoy their housing. Um, the citations for that obligation are also in the chat. Um, a reasonable accommodation is any kind of physical change to one's unit or the common areas. They could include things uh, like we saw on the slide that Vivian just went over, um, but also things like lowering counters or removing cabinets to make space for someone who uses a wheelchair, um, things like that. Anything on that earlier slide as well, like ramps, um, soundproofing, flashing, alarms, etc. And a regional center can play an important role with regard to modifications uh, that a tenant with disabilities might need because currently under fair housing law, the cost of needed modifications generally falls on the tenant. Um, there are a couple of exceptions to this general rule, but generally that's the rule. Um, the cost of modifications may fall on the housing provider if we're talking about public housing uh, that's owned and operated by the government. And then under state law, as of January of 2020, there's additional limited circumstances where the cost of a modification can be shifted to the housing provider. And those are um, where the housing provider failed to comply with applicable accessible accessibility standards at the time of construction. And this is regardless of the time of construction. So even if if a client is in housing that was uh, you know built in 1995 and didn't comply with accessibility standards then, it really doesn't matter that it's years later. If the housing provider didn't comply with accessibility standards then, it's on them to pay for any modifications that might be needed as a result of that former non-compliance. And that's not the case under federal law. Um, federal law has a strict statute of limitations for that type of a claim um, that runs from the date of the certificate of occupancy. So it's really unmanageable for most people. Um, and then the second exception under state law, and these are our state fair housing regulations, um, is that the housing provider can be held responsible for the cost of modifications where the need for the modification is due to the housing provider's failure to maintain the property. Uh, so if a housing provider has failed to maintain an accessible walkway or failed to maintain um, a pool lift, uh, they can't then say, well, that's a modification. You, you tenant need to pay for that because it's needed because of a failure to maintain. So the housing provider is still responsible. Um, in instances though, where the the tenant is responsible for the cost of modifications, regional centers can fill that gap. They can help with those costs uh, under the home modification type of programming. Um, regional centers can also help with restoration of premises. And what I mean by that is returning a unit back to its original condition. For example, if you remove kitchen or bathroom cabinets to make clearance, Knee and, uh, knee and foot clearance for someone who's using a wheelchair, um, that type of modification probably needs to be uh, uh, fixed before a new tenant moves in who may not need that type of a thing and may want the cabinet space back. 
Um, but the regional center is a resource to look to when you need to do those types of um, restoration when, when required. Um, and then also regional center potentially could assist with maintenance obligations when required, because when a tenant does uh, do modifications to their unit, um, they're responsible for maintaining those modifications. If the modifications are to a common area and the housing provider is generally responsible for common area upkeep, then that's not the responsibility of the, the tenant, but in unit uh, things would be the responsibility of the tenant. Um, next slide. And then just a couple of things to keep in mind um, if you're working in fair housing and, and assisting somebody who is a regional center client, um, the duty to provide accommodations and modifications is an affirmative one. Um, so housing providers must engage in an interactive proce process with prospective tenants and tenants regarding any such requests. And that is um, a mandatory obligation under our state regulations. It's a suggested uh, process under federal law. And this may include having conversations with regional center staff. So your a housing provider cannot refuse to interact or discuss uh, a tenant's needs um, if the tenant would like to have regional center staff involved. That's a, that's a type of accommodation and also part of the interactive process that should be provided. Regional center services can be used to address or prevent adverse housing actions such as eviction, neighbor disputes, or complaints. So keep that in mind. Um, things like, like how Vivian mentioned, some people are loud um, due to disability. Uh, some people have night terrors, things like that. Uh, you want to engage the regional center to explore accommodations or modifications like soundproofing. Um, regional center services should be looked looked at for those types of things. They can prevent housing, uh, adverse housing actions. They can help uh, avoid an eviction or threat of eviction. Um, and then you may need to provide, uh, housing providers may need to provide regional center clients time to go through the IPP process to gain approval for needed services and supports. Because again, that is a process. It's not something that is going to um, be able to get approved in a day. Uh, there is a process that the regional centers follow, and it, it would be a reasonable accommodation for a landlord to allow a, a tenant to go through that process in order to access the services and supports that they need to remain housed or to obtain housing in the first place. And then finally, the failure to allow or accept regional, regional center services or supports as accommodations or modifications may violate fair housing law. So it may give rise to a uh, defense and an eviction, may give rise to affirmative claims that your clients can pursue in state or federal court. So keep that in mind. Um, and the next slide, I'll pass it back over to Will. Thanks, Michelle. Um, let's just quickly talk about appeals. In other words, the process for people to resolve disputes with their regional centers. Um, full disclaimer on this section, I'm really only going to scratch the surface of the appeals process because this topic by itself could be its whole 90-minute training, and I do want to make sure we leave time for questions. But my main point with these next few slides is really to let you all know that this process exists. Next slide. So like many benefits programs about which you are all familiar, uh, people served by regional centers also have due process rights. This means that people have the right to a written notice, often called a notice of action from their regional center, when they disagree with a decision the regional center makes. And in front of you on this slide are the times when a regional center needs to provide this notice. So if someone asks to be eligible for regional center services and the regional center says no, uh, they get a notice of action. If someone is receiving regional center services and a regional center decides to terminate their eligibility or end it, the person gets a notice of action. Um, if a person asks for a service and the regional center says no, 
again, the person gets a notice. Um, if a regional center decides that it wants to change or stop someone, stop a service in someone's IPP, and the person does not agree, that's another circumstance. Um, two more things. If a regional center says it doesn't have enough money in its budget to provide someone with services, that's another time it needs to give written notice. Although I'll say in my 15 years at DRC, I've never heard a regional center say or admit to not having enough money. I think that they you know, will try to find other ways to put in cost controls um, without actually using that as a reason. Um, if someone says to a regional center that they disagree with the part of their IPP, that's the, another circumstance where the regional center needs to give that notice of action. And the notice of action needs to have a few key pieces of information, um, including things like the reason that the regional center made its decision, um, information about how to appeal the decision and the person's rights during the appeal process. And next slide. So why are written notices important? Well, it's unlawful for regional centers to change someone's services without their consent, uh, without providing this notice. Um, we do see sometimes where regional centers will try to change someone's services or say no without providing a notice of action. And when this happens, I usually recommend that people just appeal the action anyway and also file an administrative complaint with DDS. Remember, that's the state agency that oversees regional centers. So file an, an administrative complaint about the failure to provide that notice. Um, we call this in our system a 4731 complaint, names for the section in the Welfare and Institution co Institutions Code that describes that complaint process. And these complaints are typically used for when a right has been violated or denied, as opposed to a dispute over whether a service should be funded by a regional center. And next slide. So a really quick note on deadlines. People have 60 days after getting written notice to appeal. And if the regional center tries to change or terminate a service a person's already getting, uh, the appeal needs to happen within 30 days. And doing it within 30 days gets people what we call aid paid pending. And that's just a fancy way of saying that people can keep getting their services until the appeal process is complete. Next slide, please. So this slide has more information that covers the process about filing and filing an appeal, uh, the options that are available to people. Um, and by options, I mean that when people appeal, they can choose anything from doing an informal meeting with their regional center to a mediation in front of a third party neutral or a hearing before an administrative law judge or any combination of those things. Um, I wanted to flag that we have a really good publication called Rights Under the Nantrimant Act that talks about the appeal process, um, not just written notice and due process, but what's it like and what are the steps when someone actually tries to do an appeal and appear before an administrative law judge um, when it comes to how to prove up a case. Again, we're not going to get into that today. We're not going to have enough time. Um, and I see that, Michelle, thank you, just dropped in the link to our uh, Rights Under the Nantrimant Act manual, too. Um, next slide. Okay. And resources. So um, our Rights Under the Nantrimant Act manual, uh, we have a link to it here, but we also have a lot of other Disability Rights California resources that got at things we were talking about earlier in the presentation, like what's it like to do an IPP process? Um, what's a good planning guide for people? Um, we have other publications about um, how regional centers spend their money on people. And, you know, again, this could be another 90 minute presentation, but we also see in our systems that um, people who receive regional center services who are white get far more funding in purchase of service dollars than people who are from communities of color. I think the current statistics are 
around 50 cents on the dollar. Um, and we also have a regional center appeals and hearings toolkit, um, which goes into much greater detail about the hearing process itself and what how people can essentially give people the best shot they can get at, at prevailing in their case. The next slide, I think this concludes the substantive portion of the presentation, and it looks like we have time for questions too. So there's one question in the Q&A. Um, it says, if a consumer's disability presents a health and safety risk to others, um, not or not just to themselves, could that be sufficient to access rental assistance? And I assume this is a question for um, Vivian based on one of her slides. And Hi, I'm, is welcome I'm happy to answer. Oh, there I am. I'm ha happy to, to try to answer that. Um, and Will, please feel free to jump in too. Um, I wish that I could say yes. To be honest, um, we don't really know. I can't point to case law or um, um, administrative law decisions that really give us very clear guidance or very clear answer on this. Uh, so just based on, on our own experience, my sense is that it's... Um, it depends on how it's framed. I think that if it's framed as um, the disability pre only presenting a risk to others, that that it might be difficult um, and that regional centers would probably be less likely to um, approve rental assistance in that instance. However, I think that in most cases, um, if there is a risk, there probably are ways of uh, framing the issue or framing the need such that it um, it would likely be a risk to both, if that makes sense. In other words, I think that it's rare, <laughs> perhaps, uh, that it would only and ever present a risk to other people and and not to the individual's own uh, safety or well-being. Um, so I would think about ways to try to make that case um, if that that's a concern. And Will, I, you may have some thoughts too. Thanks, Vivian. I, I agree with everything you said. And you know, to get at that kind of question, could it be a sufficient argument to access rental assistance? And right, I think the answer is kind of maybe, maybe. So the one thing about the, the Naturman Act, it's um, it's like the Wild West when it comes to case law. You know, if you do a search on, on Lexis or, or Westlaw about the cases in the Naturman Act that actually get at service disputes, there aren't many. So we're working in principles. So what are the things that are necessary to meet someone's IPP goals? Um, you know, the, the idea of health and safety risk, it's not defined anywhere. So the disadvantage of that is we can't just look to a place with rules that gives us bright line answers. But the advantage of it is, is, well, you got a good argument and you're representing a client, make it and make it in the best way you can, given the statutory interpretation that's in front of you. Um, so there are opportunities to get administrative law judges or if you're inclined to you know, take cases up on writs to make good case law in this area too. Um, because again, to, you know, Vivian's point, it depends. Um, there's nothing that says no, um, right? But there there could be ways to get to yes too. We just need to be a bit more creative with our arguments sometimes. Were there any more questions? Now's the time to ask. Go ahead and type them in the Q&A. Um, I'd also like to just point out, since Will mentioned um, OAH decisions, um, I am going to drop this in the chat. Here we go. Okay, so I just dropped it in the Zoom chat for everyone. Um, those of you who uh, may be familiar with the Office of Administrative Hearings and um, their website, 
they do have a search engine on the OAH website uh, where you can sort of do a search of all relevant um, ALJ decisions, but their search engine is pretty clunky. Uh, they don't seem to have to always have all of the um, decisions that we know are out there. We're not really sure how up to date it is or on what schedule they update it. Uh, so uh, fortunately, our friends um, at the Stanford Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Law and Policy Project, uh, that's um, the acronym for them is SIDLAP. They do really great work. Um, I put a link here. They created their own uh, smart search engine, uh, which is uh, a lot better, much easier to use. You can, you know, type in natural language and it will, it's uh, lightning fast at giving you better search results. So um, want to make sure that you had access to that. There's no other open questions. Um, did any of the panelists have anything that they wanted to add before wrapping this up? Hearing nothing. Um, for people who participated, I will be sending around a copy of the PowerPoint as well as a link to an evaluation form. And I just wanna take an opportunity again to thank all of our panelists from DRC and OCRA as well as our ASL interpreter and captioners and Tina and Diana, our tech folks from DREDF. And I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon and holiday season. Take care. <laughs>